Welcome to the Southern Ohio Farm Show. This is Gigi Neal of OSU Extension in Claremont County, Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator. Well, I'm James Morris, the Agricultural and Natural Resources and Community Development Educator for the Ohio State University Extension in Brown County. And I'm Brooke Beam, the Ohio State University Extension Educator for Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Community Development in Highland County. And we will be your hosts for the Southern Ohio Farm Show. Good morning. On today's program, we will discuss the weather, market programs, pesticide container recycling, spring forages, and growing microgreens in your own home. But first, we'll start with an update on the weather. After cold conditions over the weekend, the good news is that this week should improve to have warmer weather. We can expect highs in the 60s today, 70s for Thursday, and close to 80 for Friday through Monday, with overnight lows in the 50s and 60s this weekend. Unfortunately, it also looks like a damp period as well, Thursday through the weekend with periods of showers and storms likely. The extended period of May 16th through the 24th looks to have above average temperatures with near to above normal precipitation. James, what do you have in store for us today? Well, this week's update is going to be similar to last week where we talked about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, also called the EIDL Loan. This week, we will be talking about the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program and these two are similar in the fact that they're both available to provide financial assistance to those who have experienced losses due to the pandemic. Now, if you joined us for our discussion last week about the EIDL program, it was open under new eligibility for only U.S. agricultural businesses. Now, as we take a look at the pandemic unemployment assistance program, this is designed for those who are ineligible for traditional unemployment. And that includes those that are self-employed, or those that are 1099 tax filers. So this, this, this program is designed to provide regular unemployment benefit amounts to qualifying applicants. And we'll talk about some of the qualifying components in just a minute. But this program will provide $600 per week through the weeks of March 29th through July 25th of 2020. So you can tell there's also a bit of a retroactive period here we're going, going to talk about in just a second. There is no minimum income requirement. However, you must not be eligible for Ohio's regular unemployment benefits, and that includes paid time off for sick leave and vacation. And as we talk about the qualifying components, you can see there's a list here, and you can of course find more information on the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services website. But just to give you a few examples, the applicant must be unable to work due to one of the following situations. You don't have to meet obviously all the requirements here, but here's some examples. So the applicant has been diagnosed with COVID-19 or has symptoms and is seeking medical diagnosis. A member of the applicant's household has been diagnosed with the virus or the applicant is providing care for a family or household member who has been diagnosed with COVID-19. And you can see here that the list continues. The applicant applicant cannot work due to caring for a child whose school or other facility has been closed due to COVID-19. And we'll skip through a couple of these to save some time here, but if you take a look at the last one, just as another example, the applicant's place of employment is closed because of COVID-19. So you can tell there's a wide variety from family situations to work situations that may qualify you to be able to, to uh, receive payments through this program. Now we expect applications to open up fairly soon. And in fact, we're projecting right, probably around mid-May is when we expect these to be open. And if you are self-employed, you must submit proof of your employment. And that can be through earning statements such as profit and loss statements, payroll deposits, or a 2019 tax return. Now we talked about this being retroactive um, option for the payments, and that begins on your date of eligibility. It will last no more than 39 weeks, which in this case, no longer than December 26th of 2020. But this program can also provide an additional 13 weeks of benefits for those who have exhausted their traditional unemployment benefits. So we talked about not being eligible for the traditional unemployment. 
And for some reason, if you've exhausted those benefits and you're not no longer eligible, then you may still qualify. So as you can tell, there's many things that, that go into the factors here of eligibility. And you can find that information on the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services website. And of course, our article by Peggy Kirkhall at the Farm Office Ag, Ohio Ag Law blog. And Peggy Hall is our associate professor who directs the Agricultural Resource Law Program. So if we go to the Job and Family Services website, as we take a look here, you will go to the unemploymenthelp.ohio.gov. As you can see, I've got highlighted at the top left part of the screen. If you select on the Get Now, Get Started Now tab, it will take you to the application where you will be asked a series of questions to determine your eligibility. So pretty easy steps to follow here. Just go to the unemploymenthelp.ohio.gov and follow the instructions from there. Now I'm going to send it over to Tony Nye, who is the Clinton County Extension Educator with us here at OSU Extension to talk a little bit about his pesticide container recycling program. Tony? Well, thank you uh, to uh, the different counties that are hosting this program, uh, Claremont, Brown, and, and Highland. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to just talk about a little bit of a program we started last year in Clinton County in regards to our pesticide container recycling. Uh, this came about through several phone calls from producers over time that had empty containers, didn't know if they could be landfilled, what they had to do to be able to recycle, if they could be recycled. Uh, they were environmentally uh, conscious, so they didn't want to burn them. And so I started doing some investigation and within Ohio State University's uh, pest ed program that we as educators are involved with, uh, we actually have a company that we can reach out to. And that, as you see on this flyer, is this G. Phillips and Sons. They are actually located out of Iowa and uh, they uh, provide a service. Uh, if we do a lot of the uh, background work and collecting the uh, uh, different containers, uh, they will come and pick them up and then they take them back to their uh, facility and recycle them. So our upcoming event is in August and we've got it at that time frame because you know a lot of us will be spraying through the summer uh, of different, different types of sprays, whether it's herbicide, fungicide, or insecticides. And so uh, to give producers time to collect, clean, and appropriately handle uh, the containers. We're doing this on Friday, August 14th, 2020. Uh, the collection time frame is from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. on that Friday. And we're gonna hold this at the Nutrient Ag Solutions there on 22 and 3, just outside of Wilmington. So if you're familiar with the Wilmington area, the Melvin location is where Melvin Stone is located. So easy access. Uh, they have a nice facility that we can use for the drop-off point and um, we can uh, uh, get you in and out pretty easily. So what can be recycled? Uh, ag pesticide containers that are in the jug form, those gallon, the two and a half gallon, um, drums up to 55 gallons and mini box and you'll see there is a, um, a little footnote there in parentheses if cut into strips and we'll get into more detail on that. This program is free and uh, uh, we will ask that uh, you give us a call uh, just so we can get kind of a, a rundown of who's coming and uh, uh, make sure that we don't need to go ahead and schedule a second pickup day uh, if we get too much material. There are some major requirements that you as producers need to definitely be aware of. One, all containers must be triple rinsed. And this is critical uh, because of the nature of the product and how it's being handled for recycling purposes. The containers must be triple rinsed. You must remove the caps off the jugs all lids off of 55 gallon drums, any metal, any screws, and then those loose leaf labels on any of the containers, uh, they need to be removed. And again, I'll get into some of this a little bit more in another slide. They must be dry 
So if I get a bunch that are dripping wet, uh, I will probably send them home. And one of the reasons is uh, because water adds weight to the truck. And if we get enough product, you know, we can accumulate uh, around 10,000 pounds of product. And uh, so uh, anything we can alleviate that doesn't or does lessen the, the amount we can put in that truck, uh, the better. So they have to be dry. And, and like I said, on the other requirements. And then many box need to be cut into two by two foot sections with no lid, no valve, no screws. Uh, we are there during this time frame of 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and we will inspect. Uh, there will be no allowed containers to be dropped off until those times. And that's by um, uh, basically direction of Nutrient Ag Solutions there at the Melvin location. My contact information is there, but I've got more uh, contact at the end of this presentation you can, you can get from, uh, from my phone number and email. So as far as how we did this, uh, we collected, um, uh, as you can see there at Nutrien, we had several uh, uh, containers full of, of jugs and other types of product uh, containers whether they were cut up or, or not. The jugs piled up there. One of the things that you can do when you bring them to us, uh, you can run a string through the handles and uh, keep them uh, together so that they're not flying out of a pickup. Uh, I actually had a couple producers last fall that had so many, they brought them in livestock trailers. Uh, they still had them tied together so we can kind of grab and go and just pull that bunch. I would say the maximum should be about 15 to 20 uh, because as we're loading the truck and you'll see a picture of the truck, as we're loading the truck, about 15 to 20 is what we can get in the back uh, before they're crushed and, and fully loaded on the truck. So uh, just uh, something to keep in mind and ease of handling the number of jugs you might have and uh, transportation, again, you just have to be aware that from a safety standpoint, if you're just bringing them in a pickup truck, they can't fly out since they will be empty, they'll be light. If you can bring them in an enclosed structure like a livestock trailer, uh, that is uh, much, much easier and more helpful for us. Uh, as you see, um, the, the picture on the left-hand corner there of the drums, those were actually 30 gallon drums that someone had brought in. And we could actually put those into the truck without being cut up. You notice the lids are removed. There's no labeling on the, on the barrel. And uh, so they can be handled that way. If you have 55 gallon drums, they actually need to be cut up a little bit just because they're too big to try and get into the truck. So cut them in halves, quarters, something like that. Again, triple rinsed and dry. The mini box, as you see there uh, on the lower right-hand corner, uh, we actually want to take a sawzall or whatever kind of saw you might be able to cut them with and cut them into no more than two by two uh, strips. And um, we actually use these to accumulate jugs and uh, and then they were going to hold them for other purposes or cut them up for this year's collection. So just another way we could utilize them um, in, in a different mode of recycling per se. So as we're preparing the containers for loadout, uh, this top uh, picture here, the blue arrow pointing to the right, uh, you need to remove on those mini box that hard plastic, uh, you will notice that black ring uh, around part of that that's been cut up. That is a hard plastic that has metal screws in it and that just needs to be removed and, and thrown away. Uh, we can't utilize that uh, because of the metal screws. Uh, and sometimes those inner rings aren't even plastic. Some of them I have seen actually have some other metal or other material that's not recyclable. So just cut that out. Uh, toss that off to the side. Don't include that in your material you're bringing that might be cut up uh, mini box. As you see then in the lower right hand corner, 
Uh, that's mini box cut up into, they were about uh, one and a half by two or one and a half by one and a half sections. Um, and um, you'll notice there on the 55 gallon drums, at least cut the tops off um, again, um, uh, just so that we can get it through the truck. On the labels, uh, this was one that was hard for uh, producers to understand. As you see that uh, label on that jug, there is a loose part of that label that's almost like a sack that's glued to it. If you pull that off, if the, the stuff that is stuck directly to the jug is still there, that doesn't need to be removed. But that sack of product information needs to be taken off uh, because that paper and the material that it's printed on is not recyclable material. So if you remove that, um, you're in pretty good shape. So this is what it looks like when uh, we uh, get the truck from our company to come in. It is, as you see, a big garbage truck. And so the reason we have to cut some of this up is just because as you see on the upper right hand corner, there's not the ability to crush large pieces of product. So that's why it needs to be cut up. It also helps in conserve space as this is crushing that material and uh, putting into their truck. So this truck here can hold upwards of 10 tons of crushed material. That would be equivalent to five semi loads full of the two and a half gallon jugs. Certainly we add weight uh, when we start including a lot of these mini box, um, but um, uh, again, uh, they can be handled. If you look and notice on the lower left-hand corner, uh, you'll see a little bit of sticker on those jugs. Um, that is what is stuck directly to those containers. So you don't have to pick and peel and, and those kinds of things. Again, it's that sack or that little bag that like um, label that stuck to the jug uh, that has all of the directions and, and information about the product. That's what needs to be removed. So for more information, you can contact me uh, by phone at 937-382. 0901, or you may email me at nye.1 at osu.edu. And as I said, for this program, if you contact me, um, that will help us on that day saying, yeah, bring them, uh, you know, at this time or wait till noon. So we can kind of do a little bit of scheduling. We're not going to hold you to an exact time, but we don't want 30 or 40 producers showing up all at the same time. And and have a big uh, lineup of, of pickups and trailers that might impact other things that are going on there at Nutrient. So with that, I'll conclude. And uh, if you have questions, again, there's my contact information. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Tony. And now we'll turn the program over to Christine Gelly from Noble County. Hello, my name is Christine Gelly, and I am the OSU Extension Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator for Noble County, Ohio. Today we'll discuss some spring forage management tips to get you through the month of May. When it comes to managing our pastures that are under grazing, we want to allow adequate space for all of our animals to have the opportunity to graze, adequate rest between grazing cycles. We wanna make sure that any supplemental feed that we are providing is fed out of areas with high manure accumulation and to make sure that we're leaving adequate residual after grazing. We don't wanna graze our forages too low. Ideally, don't go below three inches for cool season forages, or you can go by the simple take half, leave half mentality. By leaving half of the forage there from what was present when you began grazing, allow regrowth and then come back to graze for another cycle. Some tools to help you through pasture management include monitoring your stocking densities. Stocking density has to do with the number of animals you have per unit area and monitoring your stocking density can help you make sure you have enough forage for each of your animals. Rotate your animals throughout the grazing season to promote best use of the pasture and also allow adequate rest of the forages. 
animals in rotational grazing systems tend to eat a greater variety of the forage that is provided, and you'll see less issues with weeds as well as compaction issues in the grazing system. Some of the tools to help you get this done effectively include having a handy forage guide available, your pasture stick, and movable fence. You can also monitor your stocking densities by collecting your own forage samples if you don't have a grazing stick. You can collect a unified area, a standardized size, dry down that forage, determine the amount of dry matter in that unit area, and then determine your stocking density. Or you can use some assumptions from equations generated for the forages that you have. Before you know it, it will be time to make hay. In order for us to make good quality hay, we need to be monitoring the maturity of our plants. Plant maturity is the greatest contributing factor to quality. As yield goes up, our quality goes down because our plants are shifting from vegetative growth to reproductive growth and the allocation of energy changes from the leaves to the seed heads. So we want to be, uh, we want to be harvesting our forages before they enter the reproductive phase, if at all possible. In order to get good quality hay, we need to rapidly dry down those forages, which means we have to avoid rain damage. We need to minimize handling as much as possible, especially if you're harvesting legumes, because shatter can occur easily with dry forages and we can lose a lot of the leaf tissue. We still need to make sure that we're monitoring the moisture levels so that we're baling appropriately. Whether our big concern is if the forage is dry enough to bale or if the forage is wet enough to make baleage, constantly moisture should be on our minds in the haymaking process. For the first harvest of your established forage stands, Remember that a timely harvest is the best way to achieve good quality hay. We are preserving quality. So getting the best quality to start with is the best way to go. For legumes, we'd like to harvest those forages in the bud to early bloom stage, and for grasses in the early boot stage. That means before you see the seed head emerge above the plant canopy. Baling higher moisture forages, making baleage, could be an ideal option for you if you have the equipment to do so. We are able to utilize forages at a, a more wet condition and make a desirable feed. In order to make good baleage, we need to bale those forages when they are above 40% moisture and up to 60% moisture. That's fairly wet. We wanna make sure we're in that range because if it's too wet, we have a higher chance for spoilage and if it's too dry, we may not ferment the bale appropriately to get that preservation that we need. Remember in hay stands as well, not to go too low. We wanna make sure we're cutting those forages at three inches or above to reduce the risk of damage to the roots. When it comes to what is the proper moisture for dry hay, for small rectangular bales, we're looking at 20% moisture for large round bales, 18, and for large rectangular bales, 16% moisture. Before you get out to harvest your hay, make sure that your equipment is ready. That's a great activity you can do while we wait for weather conditions to be right. All in all, remember that soil quality is of utmost importance. Do not go out to harvest until your soils can support the movement of you and your equipment across the landscape. We want to preserve the health of our soils so that we can have productive land for years to come. So as you are checking over your equipment, be sure you check your fluids, your filters, your battery and the connection terminal, the belts, wiring, your tires, your lights, and that all the safety features are functional. If you have issues with any of those, get your tractor serviced before you're ready to go out and work. If you'd like more information about forages, these are some great resources that you can consult. And if you have questions for me, feel free to reach out. There is a series of forage related videos available on YouTube for you to watch. You can scan that QR code or visit the website on the screen to watch any of those videos at your leisure. 
Thank you, Christine. And now, with a topic of microgreens, is Carol Schumann, a Master Gardener volunteer from Claremont County. Hi. I wanted to share something with you that my family and I have been enjoying. It's growing microgreens on our kitchen counter. And microgreens are just tiny plants packed with flavor and nutrition. They're about one and a half to two inch growth of the seed, the stem, and the first leaves of the seedlings. And they're harvested at an early stage to preserve the flavor and the nutrition. And most veggie varieties grow in seven to 14 days. Herbs and flowers can take up to a month. I love them for their flavor and nutrition uh, that they bring to the table. You can add them to salads, sandwiches, roasted foods, drinks, desserts. And um, what you do is pick a variety that you want to grow. Um, you can pick pretty much any seed, but seed companies do provide microgreen mixes. And those I have found provide the flavor that we really like in our salads. But um, another one that I've grown is broccoli, and we really like that one as well. So the first thing you need to do is pick for the, the variety that you want to grow. And I would recommend trying several um, because the flavors vary greatly. So then after you pick the variety that you want to grow, you pick the container that you want to grow them in. And these seed trays um, work really well um, because you'll need a container, um, actually two containers that are the same size because you're going to have one that your growing medium is going to go into and then you need a cover for that container that is the same size. The top container does need to be dark because that's going to mimic the seeds being under the soil because you're not actually going to bury the seeds. They're going to be on top of the soil. So pick a container that you have and put your potting soil. You want a good clean potting soil. I do change my potting soil each time that I grow microgreens because I want to avoid um, diseases or mold and I make sure that my container is sanitized each time. So after you pick the variety of seeds that you want, you're just going to scatter them on top of that potting soil. And you're going to scatter them, you're going to broadcast them about one eighth to one quarter inch apart. You don't want the seedlings on top of each other because that would encourage disease and mold. So about an eighth to a quarter of an inch apart and just scatter them on top. Make sure you get into the corners, use all of the surface, but again, don't get them too compact. Once you have your seeds broadcast on top of the soil, you're going to take the like container and simply tamp the seeds down. You're not going to bury the seeds in the soil, but you do want them tamped down. So after they're tamped down, you're going to take a mister and you're going to mist your seeds. And you want them to be wet because you don't want the seedlings to be stressed, but you don't want them soaked. So just make sure that you do get a good mist on them. Once you know that each of your seeds are wet, then you're going to place the top on the container and that will stay there each day. Every day you will check on your microgreens for germination. So you'll take the top off and again, you'll make sure that the seeds are not soaked, but they, they are not stressed for water. And you'll do this every day. About three days in, you'll notice germination has started. You wanna keep the lid on the microgreens every day until the first leaves form. Once those form, you will no longer water from the top. You'll strictly water from the bottom. So you'll find a tray that fits your microgreen tray and you'll water from the bottom. Once you know that they're soaked, you can take them out for the day and let them drain. Then you will have a beautiful growth of microgreens that you can add to salads. This is broccoli and it took about 10 days to get to this stage. Once the leaves start to form, once you see that they're formed, you will leave that lid off 
and only water from the bottom. And then you can harvest your microgreens simply by taking a pair of scissors and going in and clipping them above the soil line. You shouldn't get soil in there, but if you do, before you eat the microgreens, you will want to rinse your microgreens. But you only rinse them just prior to eating them because that will keep them fresh in a sealed baggie in the refrigerator for about seven to 10 days. Mine don't last that long, but they will if you don't eat them. Um, so we just add these to sandwiches and salads, and uh, we have found that there is a wide uh, range of flavor, and we really enjoy them. I hope you have fun with them. Thank you for joining us this week on the Southern Ohio Farm Show. We look forward to you joining us next week, May 20th at 10 a.m. We'll feature the weather and the economics report for the week. We'll also have information in regards to the importance of wearing your proper protective equipment and then a fun activity for you and your family so that you can see the space shuttle going over next week. We'll have some more information and educational opportunities from that. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend.